When you want to talk about one of Mexico's oldest and notorious criminal organizations, the Gulf Cartel meets the requirements. With the territory centered around the border state of Tamaulipas, the cartel has, over several decades, expanded its reach to several parts of the world and continues to engage in notorious and illegal activities, which range from drug trafficking to kidnapping. But despite its powerful and violent run on the Mexican crime scene, the cartel has in recent years lost territory and influence due to internal conflicts and its many face-offs with the Mexican and U.S. governments. Before we start the video, be sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel. The Gulf Cartel's origins can be traced to the 1930s. At the time, it was known as the Matamoros Cartel, and its founder, Juan Nepomuceno Guerra, was majorly involved in the smuggling of large quantities of alcohol and other illegal goods into the United States. Locally, the group also had control of gambling houses, prostitution rings, and a host of other illegal criminal networks. In the 1970s, the Gulf Cartel would experience massive growth, and this was because it came under new leadership. Juan Nepomuceno Guerra, who had found in his nephew, Garcia Abrigo, the characteristics of a worthy leader who could continue in his footsteps, handed over the affairs of the cartel to him. Under the leadership of Garcia Abrigo, the Gulf Cartel continued its smuggling activities through the 70s. But the 80s ushered in a new era because Garcia Abrigo included the much more lucrative business of smuggling cocaine. To effectively make his mark in this area, Garcia Abrigo entered a deal with the Cali Cartel. This deal was simple. Garcia Abrigo would handle the shipments of cocaine via the Mexican border, taking on all the risks and ensuring that the products got safely to their destination. In return, as much as 50% of the profit made would be his. Garcia Abrigo got creative and created warehouses along the Mexican's northern border, where he stored large quantities of cocaine. By doing this, he was able to create a new distribution network for the drug. To safely get his shipments of drugs across to where they were needed, Garcia Abrigo employed the use of bribery to win over officers in various government organizations, both in Mexico and the United States. One organization he won over using this tactic was the United States Immigration and Naturalization Service. From around 1986 to 1990, the cartel used buses belonging to the Immigration and the Naturalization Service to transport tons of cocaine across the Mexican border. And these buses were perfect for the job since they were never stopped at the border. In addition to transporting cocaine for the Cali Cartel, it was believed the Gulf Cartel also shipped large quantities of cash to be laundered. Now the corruption didn't stop there. Garcia Abrigo was also able to influence members of the Texas National Guard, who assisted the cartel in transporting cocaine and marijuana from South Texas to Houston. Much of this information came to light after one of Garcia Abrigo's traffickers, Juan Antonio Ortiz, was arrested. But in the 1990s, the Gulf Cartel was reportedly making billions of dollars every year from its drug trafficking operations, and around 1994, it was estimated that the cartel was responsible for handling one-third of the cocaine shipments into the United States. All of this did nothing but bring the cartel under the watchful eyes of the United States authorities. By 1995, Garcia Abrigo had been placed on the FBI Top 10 Most Wanted, and he also happens to be the first drug trafficker to be placed on that list. Juan Garcia Abrego is going to be tracked down by authorities on both sides of the border, and we're going to do everything in our power to see that he is brought to justice. Placement of Abrego's name on the 10 most wanted list demonstrates the importance we place on wiping out these self-proclaimed drug lords. On the 14th of January, 1996, he was arrested outside a ranch in the city of Monterrey, Nuevo León. Upon his arrest, he was immediately flown to Mexico City and from there extradited to the United States to answer for his numerous crimes. During an interview, which was conducted by an FBI agent, he admitted to committing numerous crimes, which included bribing top Mexican officials, smuggling tons of narcotics into the United States, and ordering the torture and murder of people. Garcia Abrigo was slammed with 22 counts of money laundering, drug possession, and drug trafficking, and a date for his trial was fixed. Prosecutors tried him as a U.S. citizen because, in addition to having a Mexican birth certificate, he also had an American birth certificate. And even though Mexican authorities claimed that the American birth certificate was fake, prosecutors had made up their minds. The trial took place eight months after his arrest, and during this, many of the shady deals he had gotten involved in came to light. Part of the revelation that was made was that he had bought protection by paying millions of dollars in bribes to politicians and law enforcement officers. Also, an FBI agent who had infiltrated the Gulf Cartel in the past by posing as a corrupt FBI official had testified at trial that Garcia Abrigo had paid him a bribe of over $100,000 for information on the activities of American law enforcement. 
with more witnesses giving various incriminating testimony at trial, the drug lord's fate was sealed. He was given 11 life sentences in prison, and in addition to this prison sentence, he was forced to give up some of his assets worth 350 million US dollars. Back in Mexico, Garcia Abrigo's vacant position in the Gulf Cartel created some internal tensions. Several top members of the organization tried to take the leadership position, and Humberto Garcia Abrigo, who was the brother of Garcia Abrigo, came close to taking the seat of power. But a combination of his lack of leadership skills and not getting much support made him lose out on the position. He was soon replaced by Oscar Maherb de Leon and Raul Valladares de Angel. But these two would not last long in the game because they were arrested a short time later. After this, Oscar de Leon tried to bribe the officials a sum of $2 million for his release, but his attempts didn't work. The fight for leadership continued and this time around, Hugo Baldomero Medina Garza, also known as Lord of the Trailers, took the mantle of leadership. Medina Garza's money-making ability was exceptional, and the fact that he was discreet in his dealings contributed to what made him a perfect fit as the head of the Gulf Cartel. Medina Garza was as well ruthless and was said to have allegedly killed an ex-Marine who worked for the Gulf Cartel. The reason for this was because the ex-Marine, who went by the name El Rafles, had complained about receiving less for the amount of work he was putting in for the organization. Well, El Rafles' complaint was seen as a threat, and this was enough to mark him for execution. On the pretense of wanting a private talk, Medina Garza invited El Rafles to his office, and when he got there, he was allegedly shot and killed by Medina Garza, who was helped by an associate. On April 17, 1997, Medina Garza came close to losing his life. According to reports, he was reportedly shot in the face by gunmen of El Chava Gomez, who was a policeman that turned drug trafficker and held top position in the Gulf Cartel. Luckily for Medina Garza, he survived the shooting, and after undergoing plastic surgery, he had to temporarily stay away from the drug trade. In 1999, he fully recovered and went back to drug trafficking. But towards the end of his drug dealing career, he separated from the Gulf Cartel and began working independently. Well, his luck would run out, and he was arrested in November 2000 and jailed for his crimes. In July 1999, Osiel Cardenas seized control of the Gulf Cartel after assassinating El Chava, who was a close friend of his. At the time, he was facing a lot of heat from rival drug cartels. His status as the leader as one of the powerful cartels in Mexico didn't help matters. Well, to serve an additional layer of protection for him and the Gulf Cartel, he recruited over 30 renegade officers of the Mexican army, who were enticed by salaries way more than what the army was paying. These recruited military officers then formed what was known as Los Zetas, and they served as the Gulf Cartel's mercenary army. At the time, Cárdenas had no idea that by forming Los Zetas, he had created one of the Gulf Cartel's greatest rivals, as you would soon find out. The Los Zetas took their job seriously, and through their help, Cárdenas was able to wipe out a group of rival drug traffickers known as Los Chachos. At the time, the group was in dispute with the Gulf Cartel over the drug trafficking routes of Tamaulipas. Well, the Los Zetas job would not end with taking out Los Chachos, but continued to expand. Over the years, to a wide array of criminal activities, which included kidnapping, imposition of taxes, collection of debts from defaulters, securing cocaine supply as well as trafficking routes, and as you know, executing rivals who stood in the way of the Gulf Cartel. And these executions were usually done in the most brutal way imaginable. Now, like his predecessors, Garadanas also came to the attention of the United States government, who wanted to see him locked behind bars. And just like Garcia Abrigo, he also made the list of the FBI 10 most wanted fugitives. And to even spice things up, the FBI offered a $2 million reward for his capture. But before all of this, Garadanas was not considered a major player on the international drug trafficking scene by both the Mexican and U.S. governments. So what exactly put a target on his back and made him one of the most wanted criminals? To get the answer to this, we'd go back to 1999, just a little while after he became the leader of the Gulf Cartel. On November 9, 1999, two United States agents from the DEA and FBI were traveling in a vehicle to Matamoros in the company of an informant. The informant's job was to give the agents a tour of cartel members' homes and the stash houses they used for smuggling drugs. Well, during this little but dangerous excursion, they came face to face with Cardenas and his henchmen, who were armed to the teeth. Garadanas ordered the agents and the informant to get out of the vehicle they were in, and when they refused to obey his order, he threatened to kill them. Well, the agents were able to reason with him by making him aware of the repercussions that could follow if he killed them since they were U.S. agents. With threats, Garadanas finally let them go, and ever since that incident, he became a prized target for the Mexican and the United States governments. On the 14th of March 2003, he was finally captured in the city of Matamoros, 
following a shootout between his henchmen and the military. After his capture, he was transported to the federal high security prison, La Palma, where he remained until his extradition to the United States. He was convicted of the charges against him, which included drug trafficking, money laundering, and death threats to U.S. federal agents, and for this, he was sentenced to 25 years in prison. With Cardenas out of the scene, his brother Antonio Cardenas Guillén, aka Tony Tormenta, along with his former policeman by the name of Jorge Eduardo Costilla, became the leaders of the Gulf Cartel, but their presence was not enough to put things in order. The Los Zetas began to rebel against members of the Gulf Cartel, who they once protected and carried out dirty jobs for. Several top leaders of both the Gulf Cartel and the Los Zetas began a fight over important drug routes to the United States. Also, leadership of the Los Zetas fell to a man by the name of Heriberto Lascano, who began to appoint several lieutenants to be in control of specific territories. With all of this unrest, a split between the Gulf Cartel and the Los Zetas was inevitable. Now, how did the conflict between the Gulf Cartel and the Los Zetas come to be in the first place is something that has been widely debated, and there have been several opinions as to what caused the separation. According to some sources, the Gulf Cartel had felt threatened by the growing influence of the Los Zetas, and they had tried and failed to restrain them. This had then set off the war. Another source revealed that Antonio, who had taken his brother's place as the leader of the Gulf Cartel, was a sex and drug addict, as well as a compulsive gambler, and due to this, the Los Zetas saw his leadership as a threat. Well, according to banners left by the Gulf Cartel in two cities of the state of Tamaulipas, the reason for the split was because members of the Los Zetas had included some criminal activities like kidnapping, assassination, and theft in their operations, and the Gulf Cartel claimed to be against this. In light of this, the Los Zetas responded with their own banners throughout Tamaulipas in which they pointed out that all of the kidnappings and assassinations were done under the order of the Gulf Cartel. On November 5, 2010, Antonio was killed during a bloody and lengthy shootout with the Mexican authorities in Montemoros. This amateur video, shot just over the border from Brownsville, Texas, captured a long gun battle between Mexican Marines and gunmen protecting one of Mexico's most wanted drug lords, Antonio Cardenas Guillén, better known as Tony Tormenta. Authorities say he was killed in the gun battle Friday, and so were four of his gunmen and three Marines. Authorities say a soldier and a reporter also were killed Friday. The 48-year-old man is believed to have run the cartel along with a second drug kingpin moving cocaine and marijuana into the United States. And just a few days after his death, violence erupted in Reynosa, Tamaulipas. His death also led to a turf war with the Los Zetas in the city of Ciudad Mier. Tamaulipas in this war forced residents to flee to a more peaceful environment. These constant conflicts did nothing but cause the further fragmentation of the Gulf Cartel. The bloody war between the Gulf Cartel and the Los Zetas still rages on today, and the violence even occasionally spills onto the United States soil.